1984 brought us another obscure computer in the form of this rare beast. The Tata Einstein TC-01. Sporting a high-quality 51-key keyboard, it was sold for the eye-watering price of £499 British pounds, although that did include a 3-inch floppy disk drive. This one appears to have a disk permanently jammed inside. And the computer won't turn on. And we're going to see if we can fix it right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services or browse a library of talented makers designs, add them to your cart and have them delivered directly to your door. Aside from not powering on, this Einstein isn't in bad condition. It has a few cable burns from storage, but nothing too bad for a machine of its age. Let's have a cheeky peek at its rear end. With a host of ports, the Einstein was popular amongst developers, but hardly anybody else. And this one won't power on. To get inside the machine, it's a very simple matter of removing these two screws. Let's keep them safe whilst we explore inside. The internal layout of the TC-01 shows that Tatung weren't cutting costs during production. No power often points to a power supply issue, and these PSUs have a bad reputation for failing and blowing fuses. Let's get the power supply unit out of the machine for an internal inspection. This flange bracket is held in by two screws in turn holding the power supply in the lower portion of the machine. Let's remove as much cabling as possible to make the extraction easier. At last we can get to the screws. I'm not sure if I needed to remove the screws or simply loosen the bracket, but in for a penny. With the screws removed, we easily remove the power supply and the bracket. We'll also put the machine safety to one side as well. The PSU is housed inside a steel shell. The internal PCB is mounted on these four nylon standoffs. And the shell is held together with these two machine threaded screws.
Lifting and separating the parts reveal the... Oh my goodness. I would say that this capacitor could possibly be bad. Oh my gosh. The ancient electrolyte has vented everywhere, leaving crusty smeg all over the top of the unit. Nice. Unusually, we're not going to repair this and instead we'll use a modern replacement. This is a brand new Meanwell unit. Smaller, more efficient and not leaky. This model is the PT65B, offering exactly the correct voltages required by our beleaguered Tatung Einstein. It's a perfect match, but will it make the computer work again? I've also 3D printed this bracket by Eric Gus. It's meant for the Amiga computers, but I'd like to see if we can fit it nicely inside the existing PSU case. Let's get the dead power supply board out. As we can see, the new PSU is much smaller and I'm not really sure how I'm going to mount the mount inside the case. By pushing in the plastic tabs, the power supply switch just pops out of the shell. The plastic standoffs can be disengaged by pushing in this plastic retention clip. There are four clips. And once they're all free, the power supply board will come out. Well, with a bit of persuasion, eventually. After finally pulling our unit out, we can look at the power cable that supplies the three voltages to the motherboard. Minus 12, plus 5 and plus 12 volts DC. Up the AC end, we have the mains power switch connected to the live and neutral AC terminals. The live side of the AC input was once protected by this cracking example of a blown 1 amp fuse. Well, there's no argument that this fuse has done its duty. This fuse has definitely blown. I've made some notes about what wire goes where, and we will be able to marry this up with the new power supply. We can now desolder the wires from the DC side of the board. On the AC side, we can also remove and reuse the live and neutral wires. There are some big ground planes on this board, so I've gone up to 360 degrees centigrade for this job. We'll use some generic flux paste applied with a clean brush and apply it to the joints. As the flux melts, it cleans surface impurities away and increases heat transfer to the solder joint. Desoldering the wires is a simple task with the desoldering station. I should have had a slightly larger nozzle on the gun for this really, but it worked out fine in the end. All the wires come free without resistance. It's a tidy clean removal.
We then need to cut this retaining cable tie to finally free the power supply cable from the PCB. With the DC cabling removed, it's then time to remove the cables from the AC main side. Once again, we flux it all up before we desolder the wires in the same manner. And with a minimum of effort, the live and neutral AC wires are out of the board. Whilst we're done with this board here, I won't throw it away and I'll place it into storage for a possible future refurbishment. The new PSU is much, much smaller, but as I tell Mrs. Fix's stuff, size doesn't matter. Of course, the exposed underside of the PCB can't be allowed to short on the metal case, so some kind of mounting system is required. Trying a dry fit of the Amiga style mount, I'm not sure it's up to the task, so I decided to design something bespoke for this computer. I wanted something to fit over the existing mounting points, something I could screw hard without splitting the hole, and would slip in nice and tight. I printed the bracket quickly. No lead for good looks here, so standard settings with 100% infill did the trick. This is a very solid piece, and the standoffs are oversized so that they go to the very base of the print. This will avoid any popping off due to layer directions. Because of the size of the standoffs, I did have to clip some of the solder joints flat to allow the board to sit flush, but overall I'm quite pleased with the result. The fit isn't perfect, but it's definitely good enough for what we're going to do. But first, we need to wire up the PSU. Because we don't have any plugs to fit the new PSU sockets, we'll just desolder the sockets and wire straight into the board. A bit more flux. Just for fun. Lovely. Again, using a desoldering gun really does make short work of this job. The larger socket needs to go as well. I alternated the pins I desoldered here to avoid overheating the board. It's probably overkill and overcautious, but I did it anyway. The third leg proved to be a bit stubborn, but eventually my part just slipped out. Next I popped the live and neutral wires into the PSU board so that they can be securely soldered into place. I really wanted to make sure that these were good, solid joints.
Turning our attention to the DC side of the board, we can see that whilst plus 5 volts is a constant on all the PSUs in the P65 range, different models have different second and third voltage values. The pinout allocations for the three voltages are in this orientation, as shown on the PSU spec sheet that I downloaded from their website. Looking at the spec sheet, we can see that our secondary and tertiary voltages are 12 volts and minus 12 volts. Now we can use our wiring notes to match up the voltages. This is the board's ground point, which is also connected to this tab, as we can see by inspecting the underside of the board. Pin 1 is voltage 2, or plus 12 volts, and matches up to our red and white striped wire, as shown on our notes. Pins 2 and 3 are both plus 5 volts, so we'll use one of them for our pink and white striped wire. It took a while to get the solder to take to this one, even with all this flux. Pins 4 and 5 are both 0 volts or common, which is our solid black wire. I increased the heat of the iron 10 degrees for this one, fearing the ground plane would be a greedy heat hog. The last wire at this end is our solid pink one, into pin 6 for voltage 3 or negative 12 volts as shown on our specification sheet. And that's a pretty good connection there. The last connection that we need to make is the chassis earth. This is our solid green wire and it goes to the tab that we pointed out earlier. These big lugs are often a challenge to solder due to their large thermal mass. With our wiring wired, it's time to start screwing. We'll be using these M3 self-tapping panhead screws. They're 12 millimeters to ensure the whole shaft is inserted. It's kind of tight and that's good because the screw is firm and the mount is strong enough to hold the new PSU board firmly. You could also use a 14mm nut and bolt. The screw holes don't exactly line up. I think the scale might be off a bit, but it works okay. I'll upload the file somewhere and link it below. I'm sure that some of you can improve it somehow. Now it's time to fit the mount into the old PSU. Some of the walls inside the mounting holes become detached from the printed mount, 
but otherwise it's still fine. Maybe the holes need to be slightly bigger on the next revision, but the standoff pegs lock fine and it's very secure. And there we have it, our new PSU all soldered up, mounted and ready to test. Durability test time, aka smacking it on the desk. And I'm pretty happy with that. It's not going to fall out, there's plenty of airflow, and I actually think it looks pretty good. What do you think? I don't want to get into trouble with the YouTube safety police again, so um, I'll reassemble the whole thing properly before we check our work. I don't actually know if the Einstein works at all, making this a shot in the dark, but it was a clearly faulty power supply. Before connecting the rare and precious computer, let's check the voltages. Plugging in and holding our breath, we flick the power switch on. Testing the corresponding wires, we find that our red and white striped cable is a little over 12 volts, which is fine for an offload PSU. 5 volts is also slightly over, which is fine for a PSU not doing any work. And minus 12 volts is also in the right range. Great. Drum roll, because it's time for a real world test. Please excuse the dust, but cleaning is a later episode. Our reworked PSU is connected to the computer board. And whilst the floppy drive is definitely jammed, let's connect it up anyway to see if there are any signs of life. Connecting the drive data and power cables. Let's do this thing. And the Einstein springs to life with a grinding buzz and a drive that doesn't work. I then managed to tune the TV in using RF. So the next episode will involve stripping down this drive and seeing if we can fix it and even load something. We'll also see if we can get an image out of this RGB monitor port and use that for better quality visuals. I'm not sure if we'll need to recap this machine. What do you think? We'll also burn a diagnostic EEPROM to test the machine more fully. Well, I'm excited by this result and I really look forward to episode two. Massive grateful thanks to my amazing patrons, appearing on the screen right now. You genuinely make my videos possible. I couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Did you, did you like it? Was it, was it wicked? Why not watch another one of my videos? Come on.